Thanks, Anthony. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Uh, today is the first Sunday of June, therefore a communion Sunday. And because it is a communion Sunday, just a little bit longer with the, uh, the, liturgy, the liturgy of today's worship, um, I'm going to go right into our opening hymn and candle lighting, which is Red Hymnal number 391, Be Thou My Vision.
and may we now turn to our bulletins for the call to worship. Listen for our names are being called. Beyond the range of human voices, God is calling out to each of us, to all of us. At worship, the world's distractions, they grow quieter. We are able to listen more attentively to the still speaking word of God. We are all away from others. Wonderful are the thoughts and works of God. God's light is ready to shine in our hearts. God is ready to heal and to comfort. Jesus comes to us in worship because the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. And now, coming together as this congregation in person, those with us live via Zoom and later through the recording of FCAT, our unison prayer. Speak to us, O God, for we are trying to listen. Amid the noise of the world, we are excited by the prospect that you call us by name, that you have a message for each of us. In the privacy of our prayers, the joy of our song, and the strengthening nourishment of Holy Communion, we come closer to your sacred presence. We gather as church so that you might search us and know us. We are wonderfully made in your image. Inspire us to live up to that image. Show us how to proclaim Jesus Christ in our daily decisions so that we may witness to your love through deeds of kindness and words that heal and empower. Open our hearts, minds, and souls so that we may recognize your voice and answer. Speak, for your servant is listening. Amen. time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went down, he went and lied, lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, No, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the Lord. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went to lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And if our young folk want to come on up. <laughs> All right. She has the exuberance of you. 
the, it, well, you, come on. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So this past week, I went to a talk um, from one of the, the, lead, the head of the Forbes Library in Northampton about President Calvin Coolidge. And she was talking about the fact that Calvin Coolidge grew up in Vermont, and then he came down to Amherst College. After he graduated from Amherst College, he got his law degree, and he started practicing in, right in Northampton, just down the road. So he has a law practice. He's doing very well. He starts to get into local politics, and then eventually he's elected the governor of Massachusetts, right here from Northampton. And then after that, he's even elected the president of the United States of America. Well, yeah, once he was elected. The guy before him died, Harding, and then he took over his spot for two or three years, and then he got elected. And so his election took place in, in the year 1924. And, okay, okay, I still got, don't you go anywhere. So in 1924, it's so coming up on 100th anniversary of his election as the President of the United States. And so all this was right here in Northampton. And when he, when he finished his uh, first elected term, he retired back in Northampton. We had a president of the United States living right in Northampton. And so he lived there for a while. He died unexpectedly young. It was too bad, but his wife was still in town. And I actually knew a guy who, when he was a kid, was one of these guys that would take groceries from a, a grocery store and deliver them. So he knew Mrs. Coolidge from delivering the groceries to her. So we're talking not that long ago. We're talking just down the road. Oh, is that for me, that quarter? Okay. And so... Um, with all that stuff going on, now where was I going with this? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And so what they said at this, at this talk was that when Mrs. Coolidge got into this house after being in the White House, she wanted to redecorate the bathroom. And so she ordered these fancy plumbing fixtures from Italy. And when they arrived, she found out that she couldn't have them installed because back then there was a law on the books in Massachusetts that all plumbing fixtures had to be white. If they weren't white, they couldn't be legally installed in Massachusetts. And Mrs. Coolidge said, what difference does it make what color? And they said, it doesn't matter. It's on the books. It's a law. She said, it's a silly law. And because she's the wife of an ex-president, well, she has a little bit more power than like me, and so she gets the law changed. So there are silly laws on the books that nobody knows why they're there. They stay on the books long after they're needed, but they're still there. So today in the gospel, we're going to hear a story about Jesus. And Jesus goes to synagogue, because Jesus is Jewish, and going to synagogue would be like us going to church. And so in, in the synagogue, there is a law that says you can't do anything on the Sabbath except go to synagogue. You can only worship. You can't do anything else at all. End of story. And so in synagogue, Jesus sees this man who has a crippled hand. And with a crippled hand, you know, back in the day, there were no, like, social services. You couldn't work, maybe, with that crippled hand. And so, plus, it must have been pretty painful as well. So Jesus turns to the leaders of the synagogue, the ones who make the laws, and, and he says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And they can't say a word because they can't defend it because it's a silly law that you can't do good on the Sabbath. Of course God wants you to do good on the Sabbath, so they're silent. So Jesus gets mad at them, turns away from them, asks the, the man to come over, and he heals his crippled hand. And so what that means is that Jesus, for Jesus, and therefore for us, there is no law, silly or not so silly, that is more important than compassion. So compassion is the most important thing to Jesus, and it should be the most important thing to us. And no kind of silly laws, whether it be a plumbing fixture has to be white, or, or that idea that you can't do good on the Sabbath because it's working on the Sabbath. If it's a law that doesn't help us to be compassionate, Jesus says disregard the law, and be compassionate. So that's today's lesson about be compassionate. Okay, guys, have a great one. Thank you. I'll
And it's now time for us to share in our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And we continue to offer prayers for the people of Ukraine and that there may be peace there. We also pray for peace in the Holy Land and that war between Israel and Hamas. We continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. Um, before we get to the yellow sheet, are there any prayers that anybody joys, celebrations, concerns, anybody would like to raise here? Yes, Robert. <clears throat> Um, first of all, great joy to be here with you all today. I've been very busy filling the whole bit. Uh, Roger's daughter had a baby boy in May, his first grandchild, and he saw it. He hoped to travel to England um, at the beginning of the month to go spend 10 days with uh, her and the baby and her husband. Um, so, Chris, for safe travel, enjoyable travel, and that. Uh, Roger can handle it all physically. Absolutely. Congratulations to a grandchild, number one for him. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes? My uh, cousin Mary and her husband Joe and I are in this for a while. Joe is going to be going into assisted living in the middle of this month. Joe is a doctor, a former doctor, and he's being a typical doctor who is assisting being cared for. So, prayers for my cousin Mary to get through the next couple. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, Kathy. Just a prayer for my friend Beth, who's having a series of health issues, pretty serious. Again, might have to go into assisted living. So just prayers for Beth and her husband. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Robert graduated Friday night. Was he um, in the uh, parade with the cars and all that? Yes. Yeah? He's yeah. right. a job interview right now. A job interview right now? Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. All right. Okay. Um, well, good, good luck for that, too. Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. Then let us turn to our yellow sheets and let us offer prayers for Alan, Alice, Amy, and Tom. Antonia and family, Angie, Art, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Chris and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Edna, Frank, Grayson, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Liz, Lynn, Marcia, Mary Jane and Joe, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Stephen, Sue, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, and we pray for peace on earth. And let us turn inward for just a few moments in our public worship to offer God those private prayers that we just choose not to say out loud, but are heard loud and clear by God in heaven. Loving God, whose compassion overrules everything else and whose care for humankind exceeds anything that we deserve, lead us to look for the good in our neighbors as you see the good in us. Help us to celebrate the blessings that we observe in the world so that together we might grow toward your perfect intent for us all. Call us by name and give us the wisdom and trust to hear your voice above the noise of the world so that we may answer and that we may follow Christ Jesus. We ask that you hear all the prayers that we share with you this day, whether said out loud or silently, and answer them as you alone know best. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share together in the prayer that Jesus gave to us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> We 
bring our offerings not to win God's special treatment, but to express our thanks for all the extraordinary and especially the ordinary blessings that we receive. We give because we see the miracle of creation, we see the miracle of life itself. It is our privilege to be able to respond to God's mercy by doing good with what has been entrusted to us. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and as our conditions in life allow. And they'll be accepted now in person. And if you're joining us via Zoom or FCAT, they can always be mailed to the church if you so choose. However you choose to give, if you choose to give, it is appreciated. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now be placed here in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. In that first reading today, we heard Samuel say to God, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. And that gift of being able to hear God is one of the reasons that we are here together. We kind of block out some of the noise and distractions of the world. We enter into the sanctuary and into this community so we can become acclimated to the still speaking word of God. And that is a gift, that is a blessing that I hope we all cherish, and I hope that we can share with all those who are outside of this place and hopefully invite them in, because truly this is a blessing. This is not an obligation, this is a blessing to be here. So for all that you do, so that this place may be here as God's sanctuary, and for all of these donations that you have offered, we ask that God bless you, we ask that God bless these gifts, so we may continue to be able to speak, so that others like Samuel may say, Lord, speak. For we, your servants, are listening. Amen. And today's gospel is taken from Mark chapter 2, verse 23, through chapter 3, verse 6. So one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God, 
when Abiathar was the high priest and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And David gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. And then Jesus said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, and he was grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against Jesus on how they could destroy him. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Now, I realize that this sounds like it probably has nothing to do with readings or maybe why we come to church or, or hopefully how we grow our souls, but I ask that you, you just give it a, a little bit of a chance. So the example that I chose is the least controversial one that I could think of because it's a controversial topic. But this one I don't think is going to get anybody's dander up. In the city of Boston, it costs $600,000 to get a liquor license. So if you own a restaurant and you want to uh, you know, let your, you know, your, your diners enjoy like a, a little sip of beer, or a, cup of, a glass of wine, maybe a mixed drink, it costs you before you pour the first drop of any of those drinks, it costs you over half a million dollars in Boston just to be able to do that. And, and that kind of money, well, that favors you know, rich investors, you know, established restaurateurs, uh, big size restaurants. And what it also does, though, is the same times it favors them, it discourages like new chefs with new ideas in small venues to come into Boston and to try to do the same thing. And so really, the people in Boston are suffering because a lot of these, these small, unknown restaurants with the new chefs, with the new ideas, they can't go into Boston, so they're going to the surrounding towns around Boston. So the system works for the ones who are benefiting as long as the system works. But eventually, the weight of that system gets to be heavier and heavier, and at some point, the system breaks. So one of these uh, new chefs, uh, she wanted to open up a restaurant in Boston, but $600,000 for somebody just starting off is a lot, a lot of money. And so what she did is, I think it was Lynn, just to the north of Boston, she opened up a restaurant in Lynn, and she's quoted as saying, the system does not make for a compelling food scene. You kind of get the same stuff, and you kind of get the same players over and over again. She says it makes for complacency. And so it protects you know, the ones that are established, but it also discourages what could be because you're only accepting what is. You, you can't imagine what could be because what is, is is there, and that system taking care of the system is self-serving. Now, that sort of thing happens all the time. But that, like I said, was the least controversial example I could imagine. I don't imagine any of us really cares that much about what a liquor license costs in Boston. So it's not controversial. But you know that example, it plays out a lot of times in a lot of different ways. Uh, this Friday, as a matter of fact, is the anniversary in 1776 where the Continental Congress said to this guy, Thomas Jefferson, why don't you come up with something we'll call a Declaration of Independence? So the system worked for quite a long time. You know, the Pilgrims got here in what, 1620? This is 1776. And it worked really well for England, and it worked for us, and it worked really well because it took care of the ones in the system. But all of that kind of, you know, insider trading, it kind of weighed and weighed and weighed, and it finally broke, and then you get the revolution. And so from small things like the liquor license to big things like the birth of the United States, that idea of taking care of the ones who are already in the system, giving them an unfair advantage, eventually it may, you know, may you know, work out well for a while, but eventually it's going to break. And with religion, it's no different. And this is where it gets controversial. And so that's why I got those examples out of the way so we can maybe start thinking about this concept with religion. So today's first reading was about Samuel. 
Now, before there was a big, beautiful temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem, they had this tabernacle, which was basically a tent that Israel used to take from place to place to place. And in the holiest of holies in the tent, uh, in the tabernacle, was the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments. And the priest that was in charge of this tent at Shiloh, his name was Eli. And Eli was, was an all right kind of guy, but he's getting older, and he's got sons who are scoundrels. And so these young son priests of his, Eli's, um, they're not really treating the, the tabernacle with any kind of respect. They're really using it to profit for themselves. They're using the system for themselves at an unfair advantage. It literally says that when people would bring their offerings and put it on that altar, um, as they put the food there, it would be burned and offered up to God as a sacrifice. They would go with forks and grab the best pizza pieces of meat off of the altar and they had a nice steak for dinner. That's literally what the Bible says. So these are not the best kind of people. And so that system was taking care of the system. They were growing rich, they were growing fat, they were growing lazy at the expense of the system. And so that's when this young boy, Samuel, um, he's brought there as a, as a servant to these priests. He's sleeping in the temple, and he hears that voice, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And as he hears that voice, he goes running to Eli, thinking that Eli called him, and then eventually you heard the story. Um, he reali Eli realizes it's God calling his name. And so Samuel has those wonderful words where he says, you know, Lord, speak me, your servant. I'm listening. And with that, the end of the old system begins. Uh, God is going to take this, uh, this, this worship away from Eli and his sons. He, it's going to fracture, it's going to break, and Samuel is going to be there to reassemble it all. So even for God, um, even when it comes to religion, when the system gets to the breaking point because we become more concerned with the system than why the system is there, God allows it to break and to be reassembled. And that is not a story from just, say, 33, 3,500 years ago, uh, that's a story that's in the Bible because it has a lasting importance for us here today. So let's not think of it as history. Let's think of it as the still speaking word of God. And so then you get also today's gospel story. Uh, you got Jesus and he goes um, and he's having this confrontation with the, the, the lawgivers, the ones who are invested in the system. And he has that amazing line that the Sabbath was made for humankind not humankind for the Sabbath. Jesus really inverts the whole idea of the system of religion. Because in the system of religion, you really want to have, have this thought out there that you have to come here because God demands that you come here. And if you don't come here, you've offended God, and then you know what happens if you offend God. And so it, it, it perpetuates the system if you can get people afraid of not going to church. But Jesus says the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. Now, Mark is the first gospel, the oldest, the most primitive. He's brave enough to put those words in his gospel. When Matthew and Luke retell the story, this is only 10 years later, but the, the, the story, the, the church has changed so much that they cannot say those words. Even though Mark is saying this is what Jesus says, and, Mar and Matthew and Luke are reading Mark as they build their own gospel, they cannot have Jesus say those words. So Matthew comes to it, leaves the line out. Luke comes to it, says the whole story, leaves the line out. Now Matthew is like a Jewish Christian community. He's offended by this whole talk about the Sabbath not being as holy as he thought it should be holy. Luke, he's the one who writes the Gospel and Acts of the Apostles, so his story is Jesus and the church, and Luke gets closer to home, he leaves that story out because he says, well, what about Christian worship? What if people don't think that this is something that God needs, and then they can just choose for themselves? And so the system starts, starts taking care of the system, and they cannot say those words that Mark has in his text. The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. And so Jesus is there at this time, this crucial time, and he's rearranging these broken pieces of the system. Um, the temple is right there. The temple is, is ornate, the temple is rich, the temple is a glorious building to behold. Uh, maybe you've seen pictures of it, maybe you've seen drawings of it, maybe you've seen models of it. It's an unbelievable structure. And so Jesus sees that, that system up there, that religious temple, he's not impressed. He says, you know, look at those, one says, look at those stones, Jesus, look how massive they are. Jesus says, so what? They're stones. And so he just doesn't care about all that stuff. Instead, Jesus goes out to the people. He goes out especially to the people that that people, the system up in the temple, don't really care about. He goes to them, and he says, this is the really temple of God. These people are the ones that are important to God. 
And that's where you get that story of the withered hand. You know, that, that, withered, that person with the withered hand, Jesus sees him on a Sabbath. Can I do anything for that hand? He asked the lawgivers, the ones who maintain the system, and they're just silent. They don't know how to defend. No, you can't do good on the Sabbath. And so that man is stuck with a withered hand, and Jesus heals that hand. And as he does good on the Sabbath, the ones who are the system, they're outraged. And they plan, how can we destroy this man because he cares about people more than he cares about the laws, about the system? And so you got right there in Mark's gospel the beginning of the confrontation that's going to end at the cross because Jesus is not a man who plays to the system. Jesus is a man who talks about compassion. And so when you've got all of those things taking place and Jesus has to rebuild that system, again, it's not a story for people 2,000 years ago. It's the still speaking word of God for us today. We are supposed to be compassionate more than law givers. And so we are an ONA church, open and affirming. We try to welcome everybody and accept who they are. Think of that in these terms, that compassion is the most important thing to Jesus, more important than any law. And if we can't be compassionate, we're not following Jesus' example. That's not from 2,000 years ago. That's from today. So I started off with that really safe example of a liquor license in Boston no one really cared about. But now we're talking about something that's really difficult. There's a real tenuous balancing act when you talk about the system when it comes to religion. Because if you're here, you seem to enjoy the system. You, you know, you find God in being in church, in a pew, going through an hour's worth of worship with piano and organ and some guy in a black robe talking and nobody else talking back. You get something out of that. But there's a lot of people who are just as loved by God as we are who maybe don't find that appealing. And so there's a, there's a balancing act. How do we take care of the needs of the people who are here, who, in, who get something deeply satisfying out of this kind of worship, and how do we at the same time reach out to other people who need something more, something different? How do you balance that? I don't have the answer, but God does, because God is always there to reassemble. And so we need to turn it over to the Spirit. We need to trust in God. We need to be able to be brave enough to trust that I will find my nourishment and maybe we can invite others to find their nourishment as well. And that's that, that, that idea that, you, that the Sabbath was made not for God, but for us. We find blessing in coming here. We are blessed by being here in the presence of God. Uh, the choir sang... Um, again, I always, in the cool of, what's the, what is it, Anthony, in the cool of the what? Day. In the cool of the day. That's that story of God walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in the cool of the day. That idea of being that close with God, that you're taking a walk with him through the garden. That's what this should feel like. Coming and being with God. And in that same idea of coming and being with God in the cool of the day, we now are inviting to come here uh, to, the, to this communion table and to share in the presence of Jesus with one another. And so with that said, our communion hymn gives us a chance for the, the, uh, the kids in the Sunday school to come back up, but our communion hymn is Red Hymn number 223, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
couple more minutes, Irene? There's still no, another. They're, they're right there. Okay. There they are. This table is for all believers who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. The gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on that same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. And with your daughters and sons of faith in all times, all places, we praise you with joy by saying, We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name 
and I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. to you in Christ's name I share with you the cup and they will now share in the prayer of thanksgiving almighty God we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And on Communion Sundays, the uh, next hymn is in your, printed in your bulletin. Shalom to you now.
thank you for coming out on this beautiful Sunday, and I hope you're able to enjoy the rest of the day in any way that you can. Uh, let us now share in our benediction response as we prepare to go our own way uh, to celebrate the presence of God through us out in the world. Our time at worship is for our own growth. Our time spent with Jesus, it renews our faith. We grow more compassionate as we are healed and held in the kindness of Jesus' embrace. Jesus' ministry was defined by compassion. No rule, no religious custom was ever more important to Christ than this. So may our caring Savior live in and through us. Let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do among all whom we may meet. Amen.